Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, go ahead and, good, good evening, Mr. Pekinsacker. Uh, I will go ahead and call to order this hearing of December 13th, 2021 in the matter of DDR 2021-00002 and a adjustment ADG, ADJ 2021-00014 through 00027 for the Tigard Senior Center. My name is Joe Turner. I'm the city's hearings officer. I'll start with a brief, brief announcements and a summary of the process that will follow. So everyone understands how you can participate in the hearing tonight. I start by saying I am not a city employee. I am licensed as an attorney and trained as a planner. I serve under contract at the city council. I say that so you know you're getting a somewhat independent review of the application and appeal before me tonight. My role as the hearings officer is to conduct public hearings and make decisions about certain land use matters in the city of Tigard. In making those decisions, I am required to apply the city's existing laws. I am not a policymaker. I don't have the authority to vary from or change the laws. If you think that the laws need to be changed, you can work with planning commission and city council to do that. State law requires that this application and appeal be judged based on the laws in effect when the application was filed. As a hearings officer, I am to provide an unbiased decision maker, and I believe I am unbiased with regard to this application and appeal. I have not had any pre-hearing contact with any of the parties regarding the substance of the application and appeal, and I don't have any interest in the subject property or any of the surrounding properties. I have re I didn't get a chance to re to visit the site. I got a request to saw the request from the neighborhood association. I believe to, that I do that today. Um, I didn't get that till this afternoon. I didn't have time to go out, look at the site and come back to my office. I have reviewed the site on um, Google Street View, um, but you have the right to challenge to ask me what I observed or thought I observed during my virtual site visit. Um, and you can do that and you also have the right to cha challenge my impartiality to argue that i'm biased in one way or another and you can do either or both of those when it's your opportunity to testify um, this is an appeal of an administrative decision um, however the, the applicant continues excuse me it's a de novo hearing the applicant continues to bear the burden of proof that the application complies with the applicable applicable approval criteria Procedure will follow. I'll start by asking staff to summarize their staff report in response to the appeal, copies of which should be available on the city's website. Then the applicant will have an opportunity to present their proposal and respond to the staff report. If anyone else wants to testify in support of the application, they may do so at that point. Then I will give the appellant an opportunity to summarize their appeal and respond to the testimony from the applicant and the um, this and city staff. Then I will open it up to other interested parties, uh, people who support the appeal, oppose the application, or who just have questions or concerns about the application. Uh, that should cover everybody who wants to say something about the application and appeal. You'll fall into one of those categories. Once everyone has had an initial opportunity to testify, I will get staff and the applicant alone an opportunity to respond to the testimony that was offered. If the applicant, if staff or the applicant's response includes any new evidence, I will give everyone a chance to respond to the new evidence. Otherwise, I'll close the public portion of the hearing and announce what I'm going to do. So only the applicant and staff have an opportunity for a response testimony. Everybody else has one opportunity to testify, and that's it, unless that um, additional evidence is submitted in the response from the city or staff. Um, once the applicant has made their final response, final argument, I'll close the public portion of the hearing and announce what I'm going to do. Anyone with an interest in this application may testify orally or in writing about the application and appeal, but uh, testimony should be relevant to those the applicable approval criteria which are set out in the planning director's original decision. Um, some is some of the issues that have been raised um, by various comment witness, various written testimony, um, aren't really relevant to the applicable approval criteria. Concerns about that this is a bad location for the use um, due to the lack, alleged lack of transit access, lack 
access to shopping, et cetera. Those aren't relevant to the approval criteria because the approval criteria concentrate on the design and layout of the use on the site. Um, whether this is the optimal or even a, a good location for this use is not an issue that's before me because it doesn't relate to the approval criteria that are set out in the staff in the um, in the code. Um, please don't repeat testimony offered by yourself or earlier witnesses. I repeat, excuse me, I take good notes. I can review a uh, recording of the hearing if I miss anything. This is not a popularity contest. Whether everybody loves this application or everybody hates it doesn't matter. The only issue before me is whether the application does or does not comply with the applicable approval criteria. If it does comply with the application or can subject to the conditions of approval, I must approve it subject to those conditions. If it does not comply with the applicable conditions of approval, I must deny the application. Um, it is important that everyone make their best case to me. My decisions are final for purposes of the city, but may be appealed to the Land Use Board of Appeals or LUBA. However, LUBA generally will not allow new testimony and evidence on appeal. They'll decide any appeal based on the record before me. So if you feel it's important that myself or any future decision maker know something about this application, you need to make sure it gets into the record before me. In order to preserve your right to appeal, you or someone expressly representing you must testify orally or in writing before the close of the record. And in order to raise an issue on appeal, someone must have raised that issue with enough specificity that people can understand what it is and provide evidence in support of that. In order, otherwise you can't raise that issue, that issue that hasn't been previously raised on appeal. If the applicant wants to object to conditions of approval on constitutional grounds, the applicant must raise those uh, objections before me as well. Uh, if you feel you need more time to prepare, you can ask me to hold the record open or continue the hearing. If I hold the record open, you'll have an opportunity to submit additional written testimony and evidence before I make a decision. If I continue the hearing, we can come back and do this again at a later date. But whether the hearing is continued or the record is held open for any other purpose, state law requires that I hold the, the record open for an additional week for the applicant alone to submit a final written argument without any new evidence. The applicant can waive that right if they choose, but if anybody else wants me to hold the record open or continue the hearing for any other purpose, they, they must make that request before the close of the hearing tonight. Um, also, my decision must comply with state law that requires that I issue a final written decision with, within 120 days after this application was initially filed. So there's some limit to how long I can hold the record open or continue the hearing. And I'll ask staff to let me know what that 120-day uh, date is in this case. Um, when you testify, please begin by stating your name and your full mailing address. Please spell your last name so I get it right. Although currently most people appear on my list with their full name, sometimes when it's your opportunity to testify, your, your video fills my screen and it cuts off the name. So please tell me your, tell me your name and, and spell your last name for you when you testify. Um, now we're getting to the technical issues for exactly how you can testify. When it everybody should be muted, have their microphones muted right now. When it's your opportunity to testify, you can unmute yourself, give us your testimony, and then please mute yourself again so we don't get any feedback or background noise. Um, if you want to testify, you'll need to raise your hand virtually when I call for testimony from the the category you're interested in testifying, the applicant in supporter or opposition or questions an appellant. Um, on my screen, there's a button that says raise your hand. Click on that. A little virtual hand will appear next to your name. I will call witnesses from the list on my screen based on the order that they appear on my screen. Um, once you're done testifying, please click on the raise your hand button again so it goes away. We know we've addressed your, you had the opportunity to testify. Um, 
The only other issue is calling. Um, we've been, this, this, as my understanding, the city has a new version of Teams. Under the old version, you had to call in and then be patched through. That op is my understanding that that option is still available, but you don't have to do that. If you're already online, you can raise your hand and unmute yourself and testify. There's, it appears one person has logged in by telephone. You can also raise your hand, mute and unmute yourself by hitting the star keys and a number. What those specific numbers are, I'll have to ask staff, but how to mute and unmute yourself and how to raise and lower your hand. But we'll get to that when, uh, as soon as my introductory introduction is done. Um, I do see one raise hand. I'll get to you in a minute. I, it's just JP is the initials. Which doesn't have, maybe there's a name. Nope. See, I told you when, I, <laughs> when somebody something happens, my screen names go away, but it's just the initials JP. We'll get to you in just a minute. Um, I believe that addresses all the technical issues I wanted to cover. Um, there is, oh, it's Mr. Patton. Thank you, Mr. Patton. Um, and uh, there's yes, a, sir. Uh, I, I just want to go ahead. Go let ahead, you know Mr. Patton. Phone you. number that's in there. That phone number that's showing is somebody to testify. That is the uh, phone bridge for the call-in studio. The other. Uh, oh, great. Thank you for for clarifying. And uh, Mr. Patton, since you're here, I have a there on my, the, the on the center of my screen where the uh, mute and microphone and raise hand, et cetera. Oh, it went away. <laughs> there was a little red one under participants, and I wondered what that was for, but it, it has gone away. So I don't. I, probably it was just a ra your raised hand. So never mind. <laughs> um, Mr. Patton, what? It, oh, I'm sorry. They're not. The, you just told me that the uh, phone number was already is 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 the city it doesn't matter how to raise hand etc with the phone because nobody else is logged in by phone so we can ignore that issue as well so that concludes my introduction sorry it was so long-winded um mr pagenstecker can you start us out with the your summary of your staff report yes thank you mr turner um first i'd like to um introduce myself as a project planner with the city of Tiger. Um, I was the staff planner that wrote the staff report originally um, and have followed the case through the appeal. Um, also with us tonight is Tom McGuire, who is the assistant um, community development director and Sean Farley, the downtown redevelopment director manager. Uh, the applicant, Dustin Ferdon, is here, and also the applicant's rep, and Sarah Architects, John Klein, if we need to get into specific information. Um, I'm prepared to do a site orientation uh, with an aerial view and a site plan review if necessary, um, but I want to account for the uh, written comments that have been submitted first. Um, there has been, uh, I wrote a staff memo and sent uh, this afternoon, written a summary of written comments received through noon today, um, which I shared with the parties and yourself. Uh, but since then, uh, there's been additional uh, written comment and testimony from the appellant's attorney, Jeffrey Kleinman, Jim Iverson, Jane Honeyman, Michael McElvey, and Diane Byrne. I'll make sure those get to you um, by the close of the hearing. The uh, staff memo um, summarized the written comments today. Uh, I, I believe there was no additional um, um, evidence that was submitted and that the uh, the testimony basically addressed the substantive addressed the subject of criteria for parking pretty much exclusively. Um, the staff report uh, on the appeal was submitted on December 2nd. In response to the appellant uh, submitted statement for the basis of appeal, and the city off offered um, evidence, testimony, and argument addressing the permissibility of conditions of approval when the application contains substantial evidence clarified the application of sensitive land standards, 
and qualified adjustments for parking space reduction and the cumulative effect of multiple adjustments. Uh, staff concluded that and recommended that the um, hearings officer deny the appeal and approve the application as conditioned or with amended conditions subject to the relevant evidence, testimony, and argument provided at this hearing. Um, so at this point, uh, if, if you would like the orientation, I'm prepared to do that. Otherwise, um, I think that's all I need to say. Go ahead and do your orientation. Walk us through what that's so everybody's on okay. the same page. I'm sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. But I'm not seeing that it's being shared. No, it's not working yet. Hold on. There it goes. And we see it. OK, and my cursor is on the property. You can see my cursor. So by way of orientation, this is the subject property. And the existing community center uh, is here. And I'll go in further in just a minute, but I wanted to show its relationship to Main Street in the upper left here and Burnham Street, which is comes down to Hall. And the city library is in this location right here. And this green area is the Banner Creek Park that is adjacent to the site. So looking at this more closely, uh, this, again, the community center is, is uh, senior center is here in the middle. And the proposed building uh, would be located on this side, running north, running uh, in this direction. The adjacent property is a church to the east. Again, the library is on the other side of Hall. Um, the appellant uh, lives south of the property at this location. And this is the Chelsea Loop um, on this side of neighborhood uh, on the west side. Uh, Omara Street is on the south and makes a curve up here, providing access to the public right of way at the corner here of the property. The uh, park and the creek um, is a serpentine through this area here. I have an exhibit I can share introducing uh, as new evidence, which I've shared to the parties already, um, showing that natural resource. This is the site plan. Showing the dark area is the existing um, uh, senior center. And the proposed residences are the light gray block here. Omara providing access in the upper right corner to a reconfigured parking lot. The common uh, plaza space between the main entries of the two buildings. And then a uh, uh, an upper parking lot, an upper parking lot in this location. Where the cursor is lagging a little bit, forgive me. Yeah. And the lower, the lower parking lot over here. Um, and then finally, and then you can see uh, this is the goal five exhibit, which is uh, I've, the applicant is asked to uh, include as new evidence in the record, clarifying um, for the purposes of their objections uh, to, to uh, and, and suggestion that, that we've, uh, you know, gone into sensitive lands and um, it's kind of a, 
an arcane subject matter, but this exhibit should be our reference for discussing those issues should they should be necessary. Um, but briefly, the 100 year floodplain elevation is shown in this purple line. Um, and we can come back to that. So that's that's what I have for the orientation. OK. Um, Unshare my screen and we continue. Can you can you leave that up for a second? Because I had a couple of questions about that specific one. Uh, the sensor lands image. That'd be fine. Yeah, just a minute. Yep. Uh, hold on a second. Oh, the site plan actually, which had the orange and the yellow. That might be the better one to talk about. It, this one? Um, yeah, that works great. On um, you, you kind of a hit on this, but figure six of the wetland report, which is at page 395 of the application packet I received from the city. So it's I'm not sure exactly what page of the um, wetland report, but the map figure six of that report notes disturbance in wetland buffer shown in orange which here is shown as a uh, vegetative buffer, excuse me, corridor and not wetland buffer, the orange up in the Northwest. Um, right. So was the figure six a typo by the applicant? Or because that, uh, as Mr. Kleiman noted in the, the appeal, that's the applicant's expert testimony is that, that that is wetland buffer, not vegetative corridor. What changed? Okay. Um. Let's see if I can. So, so uh, correct labeling of identification of the wetland buffer versus the vegetated corridor and how uh, it's regulated by Clean Water Services versus the City of Tiger is, is the issue here. And the, let me zero in here a little bit to explain um, that the orange here is an encroachment into the CWS regulated buffer for the stream. Mm -hmm. And these encroachments are to the goal five wetland buffer. Wetland being here, 50 foot is the wetland buffer. Our, our standards say you can't do any ground disturbance within the wetland buffer. But what is shown here are exempt from that in our code. How come? The orange area, the orange area well, it's because the disturbance is for planting native species. OK. And for regrading for an existing path where the path currently goes up like this. This section of the path has been changed to go around in that direction. So to accommodate that, there needed to be slight grading and native species uh, landscaping to the side of the path. Mm -hmm. That is the case in the, here as well. And in this particular location where it says vegetated corridor, let's see, what is that? <clears throat> Can't read it myself. Hold on. So touchy. I have that same issue. Okay. So in this area, where there, 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 the the current development is is within the fifty foot buffer. And they are pulling all the new development out of the buffer. So it was a pre-existing um, developed portion of that, not 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 developed uh, with this project. So this project can so remove that impact and and restore that wetland. Yeah. Right. So this is showing as a 
green is showing a vegetative corridor mitigation area. So okay. they've taken out the the, uh, the driveway on this side and made that uh, enhancement area. Okay. Same here. So on this this is. Go yeah, go ahead. Um, on this map, it that orange is all shown as vegetative corridor, but you said that that was buffer impact, wetland buffer impact. Is that correct? Because it's inconsistent with your map here. So the, the vegetated corridor is clean water services term. Yeah. Term where the 50 foot wetland buffer is a vegetated corridor. OK, so and that could be both in that orange. There are some yeah. there are some um, wetland buffer impacts that are the replanting and the grading for the existing trail. Those will yeah. occur within the OK, thank you. Just wanted to clarify. And then yes. my my other my primary question that started us out here uh, may be more for the applicant, but the applicants expert. Um, PHS in their figure six of their wetland report said that. I believe all of what's now shown as vegetative corridor. They labeled that as wetland goal five wetland. What and I didn't see any evidence from PHS, the experts on this wetland, that that was wrong. Your map says it's wrong, but what's the basis for that? Um, and if you want to leave it to the applicant to address that, they may be able to just have their wetland experts say, here's our here's a response. Um, but I just wanted to raise that issue so everybody has a chance to talk about it because Mr. Kleinman clearly did raise that issue. I believe that that um, the applicant can speak to that. I think it may have to do with mislabeling in, in on the exhibit. That's my assumption, uh, given all the other test evidence in the record. But I just wanted a clarification for on the record. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. It's the, um, the appellants refer to the senior center trailhead for the Fano Creek Trail. Is there a formal trailhead here, or is it just people park there because it's convenient access to the trail? Mike, the reason I'm asking if that helps is 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 a trailhead a use that requires a specific amount of parking. Uh, well, the city does not uh, agree that there is a designated trailhead here. Okay, it's not signed or posted. No parking spaces that are allocated for it. Um, it is, in in fact, uh, a path that's adjacent to a parking lot. And I do think it's used as as those have uh, commented um, for access to the trail, but it's not one a use that is uh, formalized that would require a parking allotment. Great, thank you. Please let me know when you want me to uh, stop sharing. I'd be happy to. Okay. Uh, hang on, I don't know. I'm not sure. What, I've got other questions. So I'm just going through my list. Apologize. I was writing my note there. Um, okay. Sorry, I doubled my. Um, Ms. Kleinman's memo gives me a summary. Let me find that real quick. Page two. Condition 10, which I'm uh, quoting from Mr. Kleinman's memo, but I'm sure he gave us the right language, uses the words uh, innovative design and to the extent practical for the screening plan. Those seem to be highly subjective terms. How is that consistent with the court and Luba's holdings in the various cases that have been cited that the city can make a finding that it's feasible to comply with the criteria and then an additional um, um, public review isn't warranted for additional reviews to confirm that that happened. But those, it's my understanding that those secondary reviews, you know, the uh, final platting, if you will, final engineering, has to be a, essentially clear and objective standards or engineering uh, analysis. When terms like innovative design and extent practical are used, that seems fairly subjective and. Uh, understood. 
so the screening is it's a performative standard basically the s4 standard is what was um, requested to be adjusted mm -hmm. it requires an eight foot bed depth in, in this case there there isn't the eight feet as proposed so screening has to be um, accomplished within a lesser depth uh, mm -hmm. area so um, Screening can be a combination of factors. It's not just landscaping. It can be um, a, a structured screen, a metal, wood, whatever. Um, oftentimes, it's more effective if there is a combination of structure and, and vegetative evergreen landscaping. Mm -hmm. So it, it, uh, I think it takes a creative uh, look, but it doesn't mean it's not uh, not possible to do. So that's what I was referring to. Um, I understand, but isn't that by, by making it a subjective standard, doesn't that require the opportunity for public involvement? If it was clear and objective, you have to put a, a minimum, you know, either you could even say either a, uh, I'm making up numbers, six foot hedge, six foot fence, six foot wall, um, or that kind of thing, that would be pretty simple. It would be a choice of the applicant. They could just choose the landscaping, have a landscape architect show that it meets a subjective standard. Here, innovative design and extent practical are very subjective and I don't believe it's sufficient to, um, I'm not ruling on this, I'm just, that. that's my concern is, is um, it, it may not be sufficient to meet the standards that have been adopted by Luba in the courts. And I'm uh, so saying this so everybody gets the chance to respond, including the applicant. So if you want to leave it to the applicant again, feel free. Well, I, I, I can uh, at this point, I think I've said, I've said uh, okay. what I think uh, presents our approach. It's not an unusual practice either. Um, our screening is, uh, you know, has has to has to be provided. Uh, it's. It, and and to one extent, they they provided screening um, in their exhibit for the adjustment, uh, which could be satisfactory in that it's an evergreen hedge um, that would uh, potentially meet the standard if it were properly maintained. But the um, I think just the city has a higher level of expectation, and so we wanted to take a different look at it. Perhaps I can uh, address this later in the rebuttal if, if we need okay. to. Okay, that's fine. And my last question was emergency access. Um, I understand the fire fire district has it is fire district, not fire marshal. Is that correct term here? It's a. Deputy Fire Marshal uh, John Wolf has been the, the, the commenter from PDFNR. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's Fire District. <laughs> um, the Fire District has reviewed this and said it's okay, but there's not a lot of detail about how emergency access can be provided. Um, and I. <coughs> That was just one of the question, issues raised in the, the appeal that I didn't see uh, addressed clearly um, with this is what, how access is provided. You know, they said we're going to, it looks good to us if, if they do certain things and that may be within the um, fire district's uh, authority, but I just wondered if you had any, you or the applicant had any additional detail about what's exactly involved in how fire access will be provided well i can make a general i can make a general response to that and okay. the applicant can make a much more detailed one because they were in negotiation for some time mm -hmm. uh, and and can identify the specific uh requirements but generally speaking uh the access through here has to be a minimum of 20 feet at this intersection, there has to be backup. Which I intersection? I, uh, where, oh, uh, where you first come in. The f I'm just trying to describe this. Uh, so, yeah. 
when yeah, you come so to the to first like, part, section of parking lot, right when you get to, right before you get to the building. Yeah. So there's and, and clear what, what area. Were you saying about that area. There needs to be a turnaround. I think it's 40 okay. feet in length, both directions, and it has to be you know less than five five uh, percent grade, for example. Um, which I think is met here, but to the extent that there aren't two accesses here, which code would otherwise require for a building this size, um, they used what was called alternative means and measures. So the building itself has fire suppression systems that um, allow, I think, for, a, for greater response time. Um, so that if they do that, which includes sprinklers and, and other things, um, the two accesses can be overcome, that requirement can be overcome. So that's that's a very simplistic um, explanation, but uh, greater detail I think can be provided by the applicant about what elements constitute the, the means and measures. Sure. And I think you've addressed my primary question was uh, with that. So the, again, I'm trying to make sure we're all, I don't have a mouse. Where you pointed that intersection, you called it at the north end of that first parking lot, that functions as a hammerhead turnaround for emergency vehicles, is that correct? So that's how via, emergency vehicles, fire trucks, ambulances will get in and, in and out of the site by using that turnaround. Yes. Okay, that was my primary question. Thank you. I see Mr. McGuire has, uh, that was the only questions I had for Mr. Pickett's doctor. Um, Mr. McGuire, can you state your name too so we know who's talking? Yes, I will. Uh, good evening, Mr. Turner. I'm Tom McGuire. I'm the Assistant Community Development Director for City of Tigard. And I raised my hand uh, so that I could uh, answer, I wanted to answer, provide you with an answer to your question regarding that, and I'm going to forget the exhibit number, but the, the issue of the uh, wetland, wetland consultant. Figure six of the wetland report, which was yeah. page 395. Labeling so. that in the wetland report. Uh, and I, I'm chiming in because when I saw that, um, I was the one that contacted them and let them know that they got their labeling wrong. So it's a situation where they, they just put the wrong term in that that area. It is not actually wetland buffer there, it is uh, stream buffer. As you know, there's a uh, state and federal stream buffer. You mean veget is vegetative corridor under CWS? It's, is that correct? It's vegetative corridor under CWS. Oh, it's everything's it's, vegetative corridor, isn't it? So it's yeah, stream buffer. It's, okay. It's riparian corridor under city of Tiger. So that the complicating okay. factor, and I will point you to 18. 510-080-A and B, and you will see a difference between how we the City of Tigard regulates City of Tigard's significant wetlands and how we regulate, uh, there's five streams that are named specifically there, uh, which includes Fano Creek. And that lays out how we determine what the so the significant wetland has a wetland buffer. These five streams have a riparian corridor, and it's 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 described how you determine what the well it it describes those two things yeah. under 080. So right. uh, that's what so I was pointing out to the wetland consultant that that was in fact not a wetland buffer at that northern corner, that northeast corner, it's actually the riparian corridor buffer. Uh, what are, <laughs> see, I want to call it a buffer. It's the riparian <laughs> corridor distance. <clears throat> Thank so you. I just wanted to make that clear for the record. I appreciate that. And that's why we created that uh, um, drawing that Gary, um, Mr. Pagenstacker was showing tonight. The new five. One. Yeah, to try to show the difference between all of those things. So, right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Is that it from the city then? And Mr. That's McGuire, it. can you click? Okay. 
Mr. McGuire, can you click on the raise your hand button? Thank you. I see other raised hands from the uh, various parties. Um, I'll address those when we get to the opportunity for public testimony. Um, at this point, I'm going to let the applicant respond to the appeal and the staff's testimony. Um, so is the applicant here represented? Um, Tran Coffee is Caffey, is that correct? Yes. Um, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. My name is Cosette Tran Cafe. It's T R A N hyphen C A double F is in Frank double E. My address Trent. is I'm affiliated with Lane Powell and my address is 601 Southwest 2nd Avenue, Suite 2100, Portland 97204. Um, I'm pleased to be here as the land use council for the applicant Northwest Housing Alternatives. Um, we also have Destin with the applicant Josh, um, and then I believe some representatives some from Sierra Architects, John Klein, and I can't see the rest of your names on the screen, so I apologize. Okay. Well, if they want to test. If you want them to testify, they can. Yeah. OK, so I understand that they have some additional site plans or exhibits um, that they were having some technical issues submitting directly to the city, but they're ready to present those now and speak about them and maybe address some additional questions that you have. OK, Mr. Bagenstrecker, can you stop sharing your screen so that the applicants reps can share their screens? So, Mr. Turner, I believe I've offered to uh, use my screen sharing for their benefit. Okay. Wonderful. I can do that. So as, long as, as long as we can see their doc, their uh, submittals, that's great. Okay. Hi, my name is John Klein. I'm uh, with Sarah Architects. And I will be walking us through the drawings here uh, in response to the conditions. So the first condition, uh, condition six, states that prior to commencing, commencing any site work, the applicant must submit a, a revised site plan and demonstrate the size, quantity, and distribution of landscaping material is consistent with general landscaping provisions and be, be signed by the landscape architect. So to respond to this condition, the L500 sheet has been modified. If you'll go to the next sheet, Gary, please. So this is the planting, the landscape architect's planting sheet. So the landscape architect has added size and quantity to the planting schedule, as well as the landscape architect's stamp and signature in the upper right hand corner. So you can see in the planting schedule in the middle and the mm -hmm. upper portion of the sheet, there's planting quantity and sizes that have been added. So this document addresses all requirements outlined in the condition. OK. I'm going to come back to condition seven. Condition nine states that prior to commencing any site work, the applicant must submit a revised lighting plan demonstrating compliance with the path and luminaires lighting standards. If you could please go to A05, Gary, please. Thank you. So to, to respond to this condition, the A05 sheet has been modified. The electrical engineer has added a light pole in the north parking lot to bring lighting levels into compliance. So if you see, there's three light poles in the north parking lot and the north edge, mm -hmm. the middle one has been added. Okay. And this has brought lighting levels up to standards. 
So this document addresses all requirements outlined in condition nine. And then condition 10 states that prior to commencing any site work, the applicant must submit a detailed screening plan that demonstrates through the use of innovative, innovative design that screening of the parking lot from sensitive lands and trails is mitigated to the extent practical. So if you'll first go to the L300 drawing, please, Gary. And I'd like to show where we've added additional screening. So we've added screening in two additional places, one in that area in the southern portion of that parking lot between the multimodal path and that row of parking spaces where Gary has his cursor and in the north parking lot right where that small circle is in that row of parking between that park row of parking and the Fano Creek Trail. And that's to to buffer those the parking spaces and the trail. And then if you go to the 702 sheet, it shows details on the in the middle on the right hand side where the car is that shows you a scale car and a scale figure that demonstrates the approximate height of the fence and plantings in relationship. So that is a fence op opposite the from the car there on the right side. Correct. It's not okay. a fence, it's a screen. Screen, okay. The difference between a fence and, and a screen. So these two documents address all the requirements outlined in condition 10. Okay. And then circling back to condition seven, which states that prior to commencing any site work, the applicant must submit a revised site plan demonstrating compliance with the pedestrian access path design standards. If you could go to A04, please, Gary, it should be the next sheet. So originally, and there was not a, originally we had a path that, that connected the west exit from the building to the Fano Creek. And in the grade changes, that path was eliminated. And now if you go to the, to the second to last sheet here, We've added that path back into the, we'd like to propose the path. You can zoom into that, that drawing there, please. So this new path will have steps and handrails. Oh, there we go. OK, um, what sheet number is that? Do we uh, this is just a, a, a zoomed sketch. in on it's uh, just a sheet sketch. A4, A4. OK, correct. OK. Again, this 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 path would have steps and a handrail and connect that sort of edge condition of the parking lot to the Fano Creek Trail. And we believe that this would meet the conditions meet the uh, meet the condition seven great and then one thing i did forget to mention the condition eight which is not has is the wheel stop condition and mm -hmm. that was also part of the um landscape architects the the screening we did supply wheel stops as part of that condition as well, an updated wheel stop in the plans. OK. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. We have sheet 702. Anything further from the applicant? 
Not unless you have follow up questions. I don't at this point. Thank you, Mr. Ancafi. Cafe, um, you want to click on the raise your hand button so it goes away so we know we've addressed you. Um, so that concludes the applicant's presentation. Is there anyone who'd like to testify in support of this application? Please raise your hand by clicking on the raise your hand button. And I'm just pausing to give everybody a chance to find the button. And, OK. Looks like nobody does, which is fine. Um, uh, Mr. Kleinman, I understand you're representing the appellants, so now it's the appellant's opportunity. You're still muted, Mr. Kleinman. There we, your hand was raised. You're still muted, though. Heard something. There. Now I think I think you're good. Okay. Yes, you're good. We're going to be, I guess. Um, good evening, Mr. Hearings Officer. Jeff Kleinman. Uh, just an initial clarification. Uh, my clients are citizens for sensible senior housing. Uh, Dennis Tomlinson is their designated rep who signed the appeal. However, she is not personally the appellant. So it is the group of folks who, as I indicated in the memo I filed today, are um, in significant part senior citizens themselves. Uh, who have organized this group in opposition to the application, and they're not in opposition to senior citizens or lower income senior citizens or housing for lower income senior citizens. But as one can tell from the configuration of the flag lot uh, that the facility is proposed to be sited on, uh, the location of the existing senior center uh, the existing trail, uh, and pedestrian path to the trail, uh, for Fano Creek Park. And, um, the effort to shoehorn, uh, this four story structure in, um, this is really an inappropriate sighting. It's an effort to squeeze as many units as possible into a piece of land that the city already owns. And uh, while a distinction has been drawn between staff and the applicant's representatives tonight, uh, effectively, the city is an applicant or co-applicant in this case. And I don't say that to be offensive, and I certainly wouldn't suggest that Mr. Pagenstecker has been anything but fair and forthcoming to folks who've contacted him, requested assistance, asked questions. And that, that's not an issue, but we need to recognize that basically this is the city's own application. The city owns the property and they're trying to squeeze this in. In order to do it, um, they need a adjustments which speaks for itself. Um, I also, um, uh, not to be uh, terribly difficult, but want to clarify uh, one issue that the hearings officer raised in his initial comments as to what's relevant and what's not. And as I've read the application and the staff report and all that, um, the issue of proximity uh, to downtown shopping and that sort of access downtown amenities is relevant for a couple of purposes and that's why people have been addressing them not because they're off on some sort of vendor mm -hmm. about that issue but uh, one of the relevant factors is uh, consistency of the adjustments with the purpose of the uh, downtown uh, development uh, district or area so that's been identified as a criterion and the fact of the matter is that there will not be uh, convenient access to shopping and downtown amenities for the residents of this facility who supposedly won't have cars, but they will. But that's another 
uh, <laughs> an entirely different issue. Uh, not, it's too far to walk. And as we understand it, there's no direct bus. So it's a poor location uh, for complying with those criteria. And the suggestion okay. that there is compliance is really make weight. Um, there's also a lack of consistency with the actual developed characteristics of the area, as I've explained in my memorandum to you. And regardless of staff's comments about how we'd like to see things in the future, uh, it's the present characteristics that count uh, under the city's approval criteria. Before I forget, I've never forgotten this, and I hope never to, I'd like to formally request uh, that the at least the written record be held open okay. uh, for additional testimony and comments. And since, as I've implied, the city is in control of the clock, um, I, I don't know what the 120-day uh, time frame is here, but in light of the holidays, uh, things get very problematic. And I would suggest uh, 14 days plus 14 days for a response on both sides. So 14 days for anything, mm -hmm. 14 days for essentially rebuttal, and seven days thereafter for the applicant's final written argument. Okay. I'm just looking at my calendar real quick where we're at. We are close. Okay. Anything else? Anything else, Mr. Kleinman? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was still hey, that's okay. You froze for a second. I wasn't sure. <laughs> Frozen fear. Uh, anyway, um, so as the staff memo to you itself states, the uh, proposal is basically to jam 58 apartments onto a flag lot on a constrained site in the middle of a parking lot, an existing parking lot with inadequate parking. Uh, as I said, it's not in walking distance or easy transit access to downtown shopping and amenities and services. Uh, for the population that will be served. Um, as proposed, uh, the project will take up parking otherwise available and needed for other uses, including uh, the very popular senior center. Um, there is not really enough parking for the senior center now, which is why it uses, I believe, more or less a dozen spaces at the adjacent church um, for overflow. Um, but the church has indicated, and others can confirm this for the record, that if this complex goes in, if the apartments go in, the overflow parking goes away, period. It is within the church's right uh, as the owner of that parking lot to cut it off, and they say they will. Um, so. This will interfere with the use and attractiveness of the senior center if people can't park there. Um, if people nonetheless come to the senior center and nonetheless, as expected, have cars if they live in the apartments, um, then there is going to be a mess in the neighborhood, which the memo to you from City staff indicates will be addressed by some sort of parking management plan, which is not stated and it is unlikely to be successful. Uh, there's very limited street parking in the area. Uh, some of that street parking is necessary for people who live there and their visitors and, and service providers, and that will be a mess, and that has not been address. Um, as we understand it as well, uh, access for meals on wheels, which is part of the senior center facility for in and out um, pickup and uh, then delivery to 
their users uh, will be lost. And um, contrary to testimony that's been provided tonight, uh, the Senior Center Trail Hit, or the Pano Creek Trail, is officially designated. Uh, somewhere in the record is a map that we submitted to that effect showing it. And um, rather than ask people to hunt for it, we'll resubmit it uh, right. during the open record period. Uh, but it is officially designated just because it's not beautifully paved and landscaped. People use it. And I've walked it. I've walked the access. And it's there. There's a bridge over the creek as part of that access. So uh, it's fully developed. And that access way will be impinged uh, by this proposal. Um, there is no basis uh, for the assumption or the fiction that um, occupants of these apartments won't have cars. Uh, senior citizens drive. That's <laughs> You know, they drive as long as they can, and uh, there's no minimum age limit of 85 or 90, as we understand it, for these apartments. And folks, that will drive as well. Um, so there is just going to be a mess on this site. Um, the applicant and, accordingly, staff have tried to get around this uh, simply by the parking adjustment for affordable housing. And while in normal circumstances on a distinct and separate site, that could work. And the city and its residents, the nearby uh, homeowners and renters would have to live with the mess. Um, that's not the case here. Uh, we've attached uh, to our memo file today our traffic engineers uh, report from Chris Lamo of Lamo Associates, um, dated September 1. And while Chris is not a lawyer, he did review the relevant code provisions, and I agree with his conclusion. I think you've, Mr. Kleiman, you yes. said you agreed with Mr. Klimo's, Klimo's uh, conclusions, and then you, 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 we lost you. Your, your uh, audio went away for a second. No, that's okay. Open my head. It's so, the joys of um, the under the city's code provisions that we have cited, where the parking for the affordable housing is shared, then you have to comply with the minimum requirements for each of the uses on the shared site. So that would include the senior center, the meals on wheels, the trailhead, which is, which the applicant has never addressed, and the apartments with the 58 units, um, the uh, conclusion reached by Mr. Famo is that under the code provision, uh, 116 spaces are required. And of course, I don't, I don't think they're at half that. It's a little bit hard to tell how many are actually proposed here. Um, so, uh, you know, the relevant uh, code section is 18.410.030 regarding shared parking, and if you're going to try to get an adjustment when that's the situation, uh, you have to show, the applicant has to show that the properties participating in the shared parking agreement have sufficient and appropriately located parking for all uses during all periods of operation, uh, which certainly is the opposite of the case here. And legal evidence in the form of deeds, leases, or contracts to establish a shared parking agreement, which we have not seen. Um, so, for that reason alone, um, the applicant has not approached meeting uh, its burden of proof. And as Mr. Clamo suggests, they need 116 parking. Uh, with that, I don't want to off time here. We've got a lot of people who want to testify. I'd be happy okay. to answer any questions. Thank you. I was just going to ask the you. You seem to imply that the Meals on Wheels is a sep has its own parking requirements in addition to the Senior Center. Is that what you're arguing? 
And if so, what's the support for that? Well, I thought, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, that's, it's a different use. And there are times of the day, I think, especially around midday, mm -hmm. when they have vans going in and out, which is quite different from seniors making use of the facilities of the senior center, whether it's for reading or dancing or whatever activities mm -hmm. occur in the senior center. So, yes, it's different. But is the, does the code identify it as a different use that has its own parking requirement? That's my question. Well, it, it doesn't identify it, but the uh, just because it's identified doesn't mean the real parking needs don't have to be addressed. Okay. It's a use, uh, yeah. just like the access to Battle Creek Trail is a use. Okay. And that kind of follows up to my next question. The code uses the word sufficient parking. Isn't sufficient parking what the code requires for the use a senior center required i don't remember exactly what the number was but it was much smaller than what they said they're providing for that use um, um but you're arguing that sufficient means whatever is required to uh support the actual use that's occurring right now yes and, and not only that though but getting more technical uh the needs of the senior center and the needs of the apartments um, as identified from the promoter to traffic and that didn't even take into account the meals on wheels or the trailhead park. Okay. So we're not relying on any vague uh, standards. I mean, that's the minimum, and that's 116 spaces. Okay. Um, I had a couple of minor questions that just came up when I was reviewing your memo. You note that the um, the appellants have their views that will be impacted by this um, project. I understand where the code addresses that. that. That is a standard in the code, I agree, but I didn't see any support for how their views would be impacted. There was a map, I believe was from the applicants, that showed the views from the residents are primary to the, to the park are primarily to the south, and this seems to be more to the east. Make sure I get my directions right. So do you have any support? Or is there in the record that you can? I will leave that to individual witnesses. Okay, I great. Thank you. Haven't, I've been on the site, but I have not analyzed the That makes yet. sense. I'm sorry, I can't read my own writing, so that's what I'm trying to figure out right now. Um, oh, the, the um, I, I believe it's Ms. Tom Blinton, um, if I'm pronouncing that right. In your memo on page nine, you note that um, she argues that her access easement may be impacted by the proposed parking, which may, and if that's true, that it would reduce the actual parking that's available that they proposed. They can't provide it where within the easement, essentially, what you're arguing. And I Correct. didn't see that in the record. And if if you can, I, during the open record period, if you can identify where that is, I'd appreciate it. I'm uh, sure we it's could, there. We have both on this record. Yeah, uh, we can do that. I'm sorry if my uh, audio dropped off a bit. By the way, it looked like I was disconnected there. Just the one time that you, I had you go back. You've been fine. Otherwise, um, and then my last question was on page ten of your memo about the hundred-year floodplain, um, and I don't remember what my question was. So let me look. Oh, it says the decision is in error regarding uh, impacts to the 100 year floodplain. And I didn't see that because. Uh, the figure A goal five appears to show that the 100 year floodplain is outside of all the all the improvements with the exception. OK, I think I see where you're saying. Um, <laughs> possibly to save you some looking on the figure A goal five uh, that Mr. Pagenstecker heads up. The the hundred year floodplain goes into the imp the parking lot on the west the, the westernmost parking lot in the lower section. Is that I thought you had a re you said something, but I didn't hear. Didn't there was no no audio for a second. I'm sorry. That's my recollection. Okay. Thank you. Um, that was the only question I. Had. Uh, I, I would just add that we have still not heard from Pacific Habitat Services on the uh, supposed change in the map. 
So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, is there, uh, Mr. Kleiman, can you click on the raise your hand so yours goes away? And does anybody else want to testify about the appeal uh, in opposition to the application with questions or concerns? Please raise your hand. And Ms. Cham Amy Chamberlain, I see is the first one. And you'll need to unmute yourself. Here we go. Can you yep, you're, you're good now. Thank you. Can, can you state your name and your mailing address, please? And Ms. You were frozen. I apologize. There. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. I'm, That's I'm fun of the fun of the know, Zoom meetings. Everybody's dog wants have to join in. Audio. So I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. Is that possible? Sure. My name is Amy Chamberlain. My actual address is 11825 Southwest Summer Crest Drive in Tigard. 97223. I'm not included in the um, the sensible citizens for sensible citizens for sensible housing um, group directly, but I have a very close connection in that I was raised in the home that is immediately adjacent to the senior center just south of the property. And I wanted to ask a clarifying question around emergency vehicle access. Because mm -hmm. um, after living right next door to the site for over 20 years myself personally and spending time there in the, the following almost 30 years on a very regular basis, I'm wondering, is there a burden of proof that the applicant must prove to show that those emergency vehicles can in fact turn around as they state they can within the that's site as it's mapped out? Because I personally can't even imagine that that's the case. So I'm just curious, is it their word that they're giving you? or is there a burden of proof that they must meet to demonstrate that? There is a minimum standard um, and that's reviewed by the fire district. So I rely on their expert test evidence unless there's some, the fire marshal says it's good unless there's something uh, equally supportive uh, that it's not, I rely on the expertise of the fire marshal. So the fire marshal has reviewed the design and determined that that does provide adequate turnarounds for their vehicles that are gonna access the site. Okay. I guess the proof will be in the pudding. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to testify about this application? And Ms. Chamberlain, can you click on raise your hand so your the hand goes away? Anybody else want to say anything about this application? Please raise your hand now by clicking on the raise your hand button. Oh, somebody popped up. Um, Jane Honeyman. And Ms. Honeyman, can you please state your name and address? Hi, my name is Jane Honeyman. I live at 9148 Southwest Hill Street in Tigard, 97223. It is the street directly next to um, Chelsea Loop um, as you're going down. Um, and well, first of all, I realize it is perhaps somewhat, well, it's not picky, it's that um, the street is called Omera. It's not Omara as oh, thank you. <laughs> the city of Tigard um, seems to think it's called. Um, I can tell you for sure since I knew someone who grew up with the Omeras. Um, so we can just let's call it what it is. Um, the, I submitted a written uh, comment and I don't want to go over that since I'm sure you can read it. I'm, I, but, um, I don't remember that year specifically, but I have read all the written comments. But you can well, go it was late. It was late. What you want to provide? So, um, uh, one of my questions is that um, when this uh, pathway is being that they added into for uh, access to the Fano Creek trail um in their uh, plan honey, let, let me, city's plan Ms. honey i have a question yeah. i just want to make sure i'm we're talking about the same path the path when you said the pathway they added is that the one that the applicant showed from the uh, i guess it's the northwest corner of the building onto the down to fano creek trail is that the one you're talking about yes the one with okay. the stairs yes thank you well i'm con confused on how since this is a, they are stating that the housing will be given that people with uh, seniors with disabilities 
which may include uh, walkers and wheelchairs, uh, would be given um, priority for this building. Um, why they added something that would be very difficult for someone in a walker or a wheelchair to get to the pathway um, is added. I'm, I'm confused about that. Uh, I would be like to hear why that seems to be okay to mm -hmm. not be up to ADA. Um, I also want to make a comment about the um, lighting that is being put in. Right now, when you walk past the senior center, it is so bright that it is daylight. I can see absolute colors. Um, and that seems to be the purpose of adding lighting. I don't see any type of at all in any of the, the uh, buildings around there that is preserving the environment of the light environment. We know that light and dark is extremely important in terms of uh, birds and other types of animals that are in there, but especially birds. And <clears throat> to keep continue to be adding light after light after light, I just, uh, I don't understand this. Um, one other point I would like to make is that in June of 2019 at the Tiger Town Center um, uh, advise, Advisory Committee, I think is what it's called, they did talk about changing the zoning for the senior center and that area. And they also added the church, I believe, so that it would be um, the mixed use type of zoning available to within downtown Tigard. Mm -hmm. um, I would have to find exactly what they called it, but it's, um, it's there. And I would just have to say that is really a, a push to um, think that uh, the senior center area is part of downtown. You have to go across the creek, through the park, up an area to get to downtown Tiger. Yet they are focusing their architecture. They are making this similarities, comparisons as to what would be appropriate for the senior center, senior housing to downtown Tiger, which is four story, which is ugly as sin. And you know, but it's not appropriate. Next, right next door to it, uh, to the senior housing, is the residential area. Um, we are all put in at the same time. We're a bunch of uh, one story and two story traditional style homes. This, this uh, fantasy that they are, that, well, let's just say we're gonna change the zoning and now we can do everything, including putting up a four story building is, is I just, hmm. <laughs> uh, Ms. Heineman, the zoning, I, I understand your concern. I don't have any authority to review that decision at this point. However, your concerns about lack of proximity to downtown or and also um, that their design is comparing to downtown buildings rather than the adjacent residential is relevant. Mr. Kleiman raised that in his statement as well. Um, so I, I will consider that issue directly. Okay. Because that is relevant to the, under the, to the standards under the code. And thank you. I'm sorry about getting onto the zoning. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> it, not every you're, you you don't know, and that's why I'm that's why we're here, so I can let you know, and you could tell me what you do know, and and uh, okay, that's the and purpose of the public hearings. Thank you. And the and one point that um, Mr. Kleinman said so uh, eloquently, and I just wrote it um you know obviously i didn't talk to him but this is it is a long way to go you know as i've already said across Thano creek across the trails up to downtown tiger which although it's can be fun it doesn't have the amenities and um 
to be using that as saying, okay, this is a great spot. I, um, I can say, yes, when I'm feeling good or when, you know, before I tripped and fell, yeah, that was an okay walk. But now I would, I would have a hard time doing it. And um, I also have grave concern, a grave as I wrote, both literally and figuratively, that this is being pushed um, uh, as okay when we have, what if we have extreme heat and we have rain and cold weather, who is going to want to walk all that way to get to these putative um, services? This is this one, one, but mm -hmm. one. Okay. <laughs> There's, I guess I'll just stop with that because I just, I mean, I just, no, I just don't feel okay. it. And, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Honeyman. And can you click on the raise your hand button so yours goes away? Is uh, Rob Blakely? Thank you. Are you? anticipated my question. Mr. Blakely, you'll, there we go. Uh, yes, I am. Um, my name is Rob Blakely, B-L-A-K-E-L-Y. My address is 15762 Southwest 79th Avenue in Tiger 97224. And I've spent 21 of the last 23 years in a vocation where the saying is location, location, location. I've been in real estate and I see three really positive things about the location. Uh, one is they'd be put them close to a senior center. Um, I should tell you, I've also been involved with the adjacent church since 1979. And um, I'd like to think that a friendly church next door to that place might be helpful in, on occasions. But I think the primary motivating thing here is the price of the land. And um, I, I, I don't want to belabor the fact that it's been brought up already, but Jane put a great deal of emphasis on it. It's a long ways and a difficult trip to grocery stores, pharmacy, department stores, uh, fast food. It's not convenient to anything there. And I think location is a, is a very crucial issue. And um, I, I just think that um, I've dealt with people before who bought uh, property because it was the cheapest and came to resent the fact that they had done that. And I think that uh, it would only take one accident at the corner of Omara and Hall Boulevard uh, to uh, make us realize this is a significant mistake. It's not easy even to get out on Hall Boulevard from that street. So. I, I would just say that I think that the, the motive here is good. I, li I love the idea of what's being done, but I think it's the wrong location and uh, location is what it's all about. So thank you, Mr. Turner. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's Ms. Chamberlain, but it says Jeff Hawkins on my screen, but I have. I, I don't have video. On oh, screen. OK. Thank you. I, yeah. <laughs> your name appeared under Ms. Chamberlain's video and I was. My name is you. Jeff Thank Hawkins, um, H-A-W-K-I-N-S. I live at 8900 Southwest Omera Street in Tigard 97223. Um, I'm in opposition to this project. Uh, as the gentleman just stated, the objective of providing senior housing and for a little background, I've worked in senior housing as a, as a developer for 25 plus years, so I know that that industry well. Um, the location is not a good location. Um, the project is promoted as a transit friendly um, project when it really isn't. Seniors, particularly younger seniors in the 60 to, to 70 or 75 age demographic do continue to drive cars and the lack of parking um, is something that really doesn't uh, bode well for the, the project overall. The bus transit were seniors to try to get across Hall Boulevard. Uh, they have to go all the way up to the stoplight at the entrance to the library uh, to be able to cross. Many people, even able-bodied younger, younger people, don't 
take that step and they'll run across tall even in busy traffic. Um, and so I think putting this project in the location proposed really does put people at risk for serious bodily injury um, trying to get across hall to catch the bus because the only bus stop is on the library side of hall um, and second you the inability of people even able-bodied young people to get across hall in a vehicle um, during any of the rush hour periods is um, almost impossible which is going to push the traffic further up omera um, and increase traffic on residential streets, thereby, thereby putting pedestrians that walk on either side of O'Mara Street uh, at substantial uh, risk of injury, um, particularly in the winter hours when it's dark so early. So, um, like I say, I, I applaud the goals of the city to provide housing for elderly seniors, uh, particularly low income seniors, but uh, as the gentleman just stated, this is not the right location for that project. So. That's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Mr. Hawkins, can you cl click on the raise your hand button so yours goes away as well? Is there anybody else who'd like to say something about the application who's not had an opportunity to do so? Not seeing any raised hands. Mr. Hawkins, can you uh, mute yourself as well? We'll get a little, I can hear your chair squeak. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, Sharon Mosnet, am I pronouncing that right? I'll let you. Uh, Ms. Ma Ms. Mosnet, if I'm pronouncing that right, you're you're muted. There we go. Okay, now we're Thank good. Thank you. Yep, I can hear you great now. Okay, I live Thank at you. one. Tell me your name and spell your last name because it's got really small. Okay, Sharon Mosnet, M-O-Z-N-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Thank you. And your mailing address, please. 13986 Southwest Hillshire Drive. Portland, Oregon, 97223. Thank you. Go ahead. I guess um, I'm kind of representing, representing the senior citizens who use the senior center. I don't know if there are any other others that are present here today, but um, as I wrote in my letter, which I hope you've had a chance to read, um, mm -hmm. it's a real treasure for seniors of Tigard. And I'm afraid this addition of many, many, many cars and additional people may make it such that the locals can't get in there. They can't get in, and when they get in, they can't can't make use of the facilities because it'll just add a big population and a traffic snarl that will be so frustrating that people will stay home. And a lot of the people coming out of houses around Tigard are alone. And this is really an important outlet for them to be present there. So um, I would hate to see this benefit some seniors while disincentivizing a large population from coming to a place they really need. It's really important, important resource, and uh, we're thankful for it. Thank and you. Guess, oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can you mute your microphone and click on the raise your hand button? Thank you. Uh, Denise Tomlin Tomlinson. Yes, that's me. Um, okay. I have, mm, wanna, com gone, wanna comment on oh, several- Ms. Tom, before you do, Ms. Tomlinson, can you state your mailing, state your name and your mailing address? Danis Tomlinson, 8825 eight, eight, Southwest Omera Street, Tigard 97223. Okay, go ahead. Well, I want to comment on several co other comments that have been made. Um, I totally agree with what um, Jane was saying earlier, but one thing that wasn't mentioned by those people talking about the trail, as well as Jeff uh, using the trail, is the um, flooding that happens on it regularly. I have sent pictures in. Um, I've seen them. Yes, it doesn't take very much for it to flood. And that... Um, that causes a problem, it, plus the fact just the slipperiness and everything is mentioned earlier. Going back and then for the, um, going back to the uh, safety regarding um, like fire trucks, nothing has been mentioned at all about ambulances. My understanding is that generally when an ambulance is sent, a fire truck is sent, and they kept saying, well, we're giving this leeway because we're gonna make extra safety standards for a fire to the building. 
But what about if somebody needs, they need to get an ambulance to the lower parking lot or just getting an ambulance and fire trucks in there at the same, fire truck in there at the same time, the driveway, they sh well, they shut, they call it a courtyard, but the courtyard between the senior center and the apartments is actually the only driveway to the lower parking lot. And that is also the driveway that they have said is gonna need to be used by anyone um, living next door to the center. We see how many families use bikes, on, individuals and families use the uh, trail with their bikes. That's a lot of them come and bring their cars and unload their bikes there so they can access the trail with their bikes. And it has been said that the new pedestrian trail between the church and the building will be a pedestrian mm -hmm. path. And if somebody wants to use a bike, they're gonna need to go use the driveway between the senior center and the new apartments, which they also call a courtyard. And for some reason I see if this is a kind of a semi courtyard with people hanging out there and then you have families, <clears throat> they're not gonna wanna use that trail. Plus it's gonna be pretty narrow. I don't understand why they're making such a narrow driveway that's gonna be the only driveway to the lower parking lot. Um, <clears throat> and they're going back to the parking in general, they're making the spots, the minimum requirement. Well, I can't tell you how many people have said seniors don't want the minimum requirement. They need a little wider spaces and they're- But they're I can't make them do a, I can't require that they provide more than the minimum. The code sets the standard and that's all the city can require. Okay. I know the city is in, a session, in essence the applicant, but they are a, the applicant in this case. So they're subject to the same standards as any private developer. Well, you know, well. I'm talking safety, but I guess they don't worry about safety for seniors. They don't really care. Um, Regardless of who's using this, the city has looked at the, when they adopted these standards, they determined that that's an adequate size for a parking space. I, I will I will not comment on that anymore. Um, but going back to <clears throat> like Meals on Wheels and the events happening there, there is um, a truck that comes in every morning to deliver supplies for the senior center four meals on wheels and it goes to the back side, to the um, the west side of the the back side. So there is a fairly large truck that comes through every day. So if the if there's all the parking spots are filled up and people do line up for meals on wheels, they come in and they line up to pick up their meals to take. So that does create another issue. And as far as the over- Tomlinson, I have a question for you on that last one. Um, you said that the Meals on Wheels delivery truck comes in and uses the west side driveway. So, so no, they come to the, the far back. side of the city. What, well, what's the, back the, the driveway that's there now that's going to be going away? Is that what you mean? Or no, the lower I, parking lot? No, I'm sorry. I, I missed what I, I meant. You mean the, north. the west side of the building. Um, the west side of the building in the current plan, there is nothing there. there right now, there's a narrow driveway that connects the low, upper and lower parking lot. There is a kitchen at the back side of the senior center. There's a what at the back side of the senior center? Kitchen I, at the I, back I, I, Okay, that may be. I'm just trying to understand where you're saying the truck is going. I'm afraid we've got north and south and east and west confused, and I just want to clarify. That's all I'm trying it to say. It goes to the west side of the senior center. Okay, because the there's a driveway there now. That's what they're, yeah, that narrow not, driveway no. that's, they're not using that driveway. They're using the okay, because that's the only driveway to the west. So, no. Um, I, I, it the heads to the west. Is to the east of the site. The church, the exist, the, church, the park no, no, is no, to no. the north. Isn't there a delivery dock there? There's a delivery dock. Where? At the oh, west. on the west, at the west end of the building, on the south face. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Are just yeah. North face, north. Sorry. Right. I'm just. Saying. Are they using the upper parking lot or the lower parking lot for that truck? I think that's the, what I'm trying to find out. They're using the upper parking lot. Okay, thank you. That's what I needed. <laughs> but I'm just, all I'm saying is there's more activity going on than is sometimes represented. Yeah, uh, I understand. I just wanted to make sure I understood about the the truck. Yeah, sorry, and I wasn't very clear about that. It was mentioned in your comments, and I, I was, I, uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to clarify. I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but just wanted yeah, to make no, sure we're I, on I the just, same page. Yeah, well, I guess I didn't describe it. So I said the trucks, the side of it, let's see, the narrow driveway, the, uh, uh, the ambulance I mentioned and the narrow, okay. I guess that kind of safety parking. Oh, one thing I will say about the parking, they've talked about, well, if they have need extra places, if visitors come, they can park on Chelsea Loop, which was stated by the city. 
And when the Chelsea people complained, they said, well, after it all, it is a public street because there's a very narrow, there's a very short pathway from the lower parking lot to Chelsea Loop, which is a very family friendly, it's a family neighborhood. And um, I just wanted to point that out that they, their parking strategy, one of the parking strategies was to allow people to park on Chelsea Loop. Mm -hmm. I guess that does it. <laughs> okay, thank you, ma'am. Glad we were able to clarify that issue I'm too. Sorry, it was so. Um, I, I, I was. No, worried. that's okay. I was. <laughs> you you know what you're talking about. I want to make sure I was on the, literally the same page as you were. So now I understand exactly where you're talking. Well, about. and I, I say that because they denied that trucks came in like that, and I see them every morning. Okay, thank you. Um, get Ms. Tomlin. And can you click on the raise your hand so it goes away? Does anybody else want to say anything who's not had the opportunity to do so? Going once, going twice, not seeing any more. Okay, we'll go back. Oh, there we go. <laughs> a hand appears on the bottom and it takes a while before it shows up next to a name. Uh, Ms. Masnet, if I'm pronouncing that right, could you had another question or comment? I, I do. Um... I drove through there today and would really recommend you do so. It gives you a really much better sense when you're there. Um, and I've noticed a lot more traffic is using that street because now that people have uh, these devices in their cars, they can know where the streets are busy and know what alternative routes exist. Which, so, which street are we talking about? Omar. Uh, um, Omar, thank you. If I'm pronouncing it right, it's my, it's busier than when I was last able to use the senior center two years ago, and I would just attribute that to people using that as a shortcut. So that's going to be another piece of consideration of when you have many more people entering and exiting that parking lot, plus the people cutting through. Uh, it's going to be a real bottleneck. Thank you. Thank you for letting me talk twice. <laughs> okay, last one. Anybody want to say anything? Okay, um, Mr. Pegasacker or um, Mr. McGuire, anything further from the city? Um, yes. Is, is this the rebuttal period? Yes, Mr. Pegasacker. Can you state your name just so we know? Because you're not on my video right now. Yeah, Jerry Pagenstecker. Pagenstecker. Apologize, I screw up your name every time. <laughs> it's all right. It it rolls. Um, yes, you know, just a couple of things. Um, first of all, I want to be sure that the late comments that we received afternoon today um, will be coming your way, for the yep. record. Thank you. Um, that uh, the, the exhibits that John Klein uh, spoke to are under review by the city regarding and the conditions. Those, of the be, those are exhibits already, but you're, the city's reviewing them. Yeah. OK, they, they, they will be a bit available for public review as well, just just to clarify. Uh, what I mean is that, is that uh, uh, we haven't had a chance, city hasn't had a chance to look at okay. them and, and do them as to meeting conditions, although they show a good faith in a going a long way, and some of them actually have resulted in conditions being not required anymore. So more about that in our subsequent testimony. Okay, Mr. Mr. Pegasacker, before uh, you move on, David Guest, it looks like you're unmuted. Can you mute yourself because we're getting a little feedback or background noise? You'll need, there's should be a microphone next to your name that you can click or uh, actually if you on the bottom middle of my screen it shows up as a microphone i think you got it thank you go ahead mr pegasacker stack yes um the applicant is requested to keep the record open for 14 days 14 days and seven days um and i believe the applicant is going to be a fine, but that will require an extension of the current 120 day rule, which uh, as extended, extends to January 12th. And I believe the cumulative 35 days would take us to January 18th. So um, unless I'm mistaken, uh, we, the applicant can, 
can provide the extension necessary. Okay. Is there a when you say that the January 18th is what? Is that the exceeding the maximum review period or the? I know they I'm can taking, extend 120 days a certain amount, but then it runs into you can't extend it anymore. Is that where we're at? No, we're not anywhere near that. It's been extended okay, 30 good. days. Okay. Already. Okay. To and that puts us to January 12th under current extensions. Yes. Correct. Okay. And okay. so I believe with the um, open record, that would push us to January 18th. For two weeks, two weeks, and a week. Okay. To require an additional extension. Yeah. Which I believe the is willing to grant. Great. Thank you. Um, a couple of a couple of points that Mr. Kleinman raised, um, where he said the access to the park was impinged by development. I believe he's referring to the um, <clears throat> the path that currently serves the park access uh, that goes up a steep hill into the parking lot and through the parking lot to Omara, Omera Street. And thank you for the correction on the pronunciation, Omera. Um, and actually, that impingement and that steep grade uh, exists today, actually. And the access, pedestrian access to the park is improved with the proposal by a formal eight foot wide path that is uh, safe and ADA accessible, whereas the current connection is not ADA accessible. It's too steep, I assume. Yes. Right. Um, also, uh, the, the the question about um, whether or not you need to account for all the the uses on the site and the parking required for that. The city did an analysis, uh, which we didn't include in the findings of, of the staff report because we didn't feel it was necessary given the waiver pr provided um, for the specific use proposed. But we do have that information showing that given the, um, the various uses on the site that the proposed parking meets that minimum parking standard. And we can share that. Yeah, if you want me to consider it, you'd have to submit your analysis. So it's up to the city if they want to do that in the afternoon. All right, thank you. Um, regarding views affected, uh, we feel that the orientation of the building actually is beneficial for most uh, people are concerned uh, in that it's perpendicular to the park. And so the narrow, the narrow uh, face of the building is, is um, what, what would, well, rather than the broad, the breadth of the building, if it were oriented 90 degrees to what it's proposed. So we think that it uh, respects the views from neighboring properties of the park. Um, <clears throat> I was unclear about the comments uh, you and Mr. Kleiman had about the 100 year flood plan that it was impacted by the parking lot when the exhibit that we introduced. Um, I wouldn't goal say five, impacted, or I didn't mean to say impacted. I'm trying to, the figure five, a goal five, figure eight, goal yeah. five. Uh, that you had up um, the blue line that shows the. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the Gulf 5 wetland buffer. I was looking at the wrong line. So the purple line is 100 year elevation. So I was completely wrong. Um, OK, so just just to apologies for that. Then. Thank you for pointing out my error. Sure, the purple line is the is the 100 year flood and it, it does not and no part of the proposed development is within is is uh, connects with that. Uh, the PHS comment um, that Mr. Kleinman said was absent. I believe the applicant had a conversation with PHS to clarify that the notation had been in error and they can provide that as well. Uh, that's that's it. OK, thank you. Um, Ms. Trencafe, you have a response from the applicant or other 
applicants reps that you want to have? Sure. Um, Gary hit a couple of the points that I was going to, and he's right that we're the applicant is fine with the extension. Okay, great. Um, and PHS is not online for this hearing, so we will submit the additional explanation. What looks like great. The original submission. And then <clears throat> the last thing I'd like to address is just this argument that the code somehow requires a demand analysis, like a separate from the minimum parking requirement demand analysis for this project, which is just not something that is, there is no code requirement for that. Um, the city has adopted the code with the specific minimum parking requirements for each type of use. It has a section that addresses this type of project where there are multiple uses on the same site. It also has the shared parking option if you're looking to rely on separate sites to meet, meet your parking requirements. And then it also has the specific parking adjustment, um, which the applicant is taking advantage of here. And embodied in that code section is a public policy decision that there are certain um, uses and development that the city wants to encourage, like affordable housing and senior housing, and the city has decided that in order to encourage that type of development, it is willing to either reduce or even waive entirely the parking requirements for that type of development. And there, there is no um, separate condition in that adjustment section that says the city will only reduce the parking requirement or waive the parking requirement if the applicant does a separate demand analysis demonstrating that the, whatever parking is to be provided will still meet the needs of the needs of the development. So it's it is a it is a public policy decision that the city has already made and codified. Okay. Is that it from the applicant at this point? Yes. Thank you. I'm going to grab my calendar then. Um, Mr. Bagenstacker, what what uh, time does the city need to receive anything that's submitted um, on the last day for the open record periods? Every jurisdiction's different and I can't keep track. Is it four or five? Four o'clock, I think. Four o'clock, thank you. So what I'm going to do is hold the record open. I'm going to close the hearing. I'm going to hold the record open. Yeah, um, I just want to, Miss Amy, I've got a hand, two hands raised. I'm just going to take questions. I'm not going to allow any additional testimony because I've closed the, um, as I noted, the applicant alone gets final word, but I am going to hold the record open. So you will have an opportunity to submit any additional testimony in writing. But if you have questions as far as procedures or Ms. Chamberlain, go ahead yeah, and uh, unmute yourself. Yes, Amy Chamberlain again, 11825 Southwest Summercrest Drive in Tigard and C H A M B E R L A I N. I apologize for not spelling previously, but I was having the audio uh, complications. That's okay. I guess my question is, um, and with all due respect, the um, the most recent um, applicant representative had stated that you know when the code comes in question but yet the city has approved the code. At what point does the applicant in the city that has the ability to approve code to meet their ap the applicant's requirements become a conflict of interest? I guess I think it about that in relation. Yeah, it's I'll their stop with separate the issue. OK, it's yeah. they're separate. It's the city council has adopted the code that applies to all applicants now, um, whether the city or private developer or anybody else. So they're subject again, to the same standard. The and city could change fair. it, but they're not required to, and I can't make them. So I have to hold yeah, them to what they've been done. There's nothing in the law that prevents that from a um, a conflict of interest is my question, because I, I don't pretty, believe it creates a conflict of interest because. Because they can vote the same the standard law applies to everybody. Them, they could they change can, it if they, they wanted to. In, they can vote in the code that allows them to push the applicants project through. I 
And I guess this that's one of the questions. And I'm not an expert time. in the law. That's why I'm asking the question. Oh, I appreciate me, that, but uh, I'm afraid we're, yeah. we're getting into issues, and I yeah. don't want to do that at this point. You can add that into your written argument if you want to during the open record. Um, Ms. Tomlinson, maybe you have a question. I'm not trying to. Um, okay. I I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, what we're thinking is, I was the one that suggested that what looks what looks good on paper looks totally different in person. And I have yeah. seen. I've I've had visitors. So many visitors come and actually see the site, and they cannot believe what's being proposed. So Tom, we, listen, I think I know where you're going. I can't do a site visit at this point because I I have to close the hearing. In order to do a site visit, everybody has to be able to ask me what I observed or thought I observed. But as I noted at the hearing, I did do a Google Street View but that's totally site different. visit. Totally okay. different. Right. But, totally different. And I, will, I, I, I don't have the ability to do that at this point. Well, I do want to make one comment, though. That I, I can't take any additional testimony. That you could can submit I, it in I, writing. If, it's, if there's a question about a procedure, I'll happy to take it, but not any well, additional The procedure testimony. is my, my OK, procedural question about what they're saying over and over and over and over again is waiver, 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 waiver. That's my last comment. And that's OK. That's something I have to consider, whether it meets the standards. So I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to hold the record open for a total of five weeks, I guess. So I'm going to hold it open for two weeks for anybody to submit additional testimony and evidence uh, until the 27th of December at four o'clock. So anything you want to submit has to be physically received by the city by four o'clock on the 27th of December. Um, you can submit that to Mr. Pagenstucker and he will uh, forward it on to me, but it will be part of the record. Um, I will hold it open for a second two week period. All right, shouldn't have flipped my calendar. Um, until January 10th of 2022 um, for anybody to respond to whatever was submitted during the first two week period. The second two week period is limited to responses. You can't raise any new evidence, or excuse me, new issues at that point. It just responds to whatever was submitted during the first two week period. And then until the 17th of January, 2022, for the applicant alone to submit a final written argument without any new evidence. If the applicant wants to, they can waive. Um, I'm going to reopen the hearing for just a moment because I have to ask the applicant if they're willing to extend the 120 day clock for this purpose. Uh, Mr. Pagenstacker said they would, but I want it from the applicant. But this is what I'm predisposed to do until the 20, excuse me, the 17th for the applicant. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Trinkoff. That's fine to extend that. Um, I want some. I, I want to give you specific dates here. I just said the 17th is the end of our and the final argument for the applicant, which would, if I get two weeks, would you be willing to extend the 120 day clock until February 14th, which gives me three weeks just in, to write the decision after the close of the record. I should be able to get it out in two weeks, but just in case we have run into any issues. It, it does seem like a complicated record, so that, that sounds fine. Okay, and I'll ask you to submit something in writing during the open record period to that effect, just so we have it, um, but I appreciate that. So with that, I'm going to reclose the hearing. Uh, I will hold the record open, as I noted, until the 27th of December 2021 for anybody to submit new evidence, the 10th of January 2022 for anybody to respond to whatever was submitted during the first two weeks, the 17th of January for the applicant alone to submit a final argument, and I will try and get my decision out by the 31st of January. Uh, it will definitely be there by the 7th of February. Um, I will send it to the city. The city will send it to parties of record. So anybody who has testified orally or in writing before, or who does so before the close of the record to the public on the end of the, <laughs> the 10th of January will be sure and will be a party of record. You'll get notice of my decision when it's issued. That concludes our hearing. Thank you all for your patience with our online technical issues. We had some um, some audio and video <laughs> delays, but I think everybody was able to understand. I know I was, but thank you.